It's, uh, it's wonderful to see you here today, so thank you so much for coming. So let's pray together as we start. So Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you for the privilege of gathering, something we perhaps took for granted for so long, and we now realise what a precious thing it is. And so we pray today that you would come Holy Spirit and move among us. May the words that you have for us today uh, be just what we need to hear. In Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, the word this morning comes from the Gospel of St Matthew, chapter 21, beginning to read at verse 33, the parable of the tenants. Listen to another par parable. There was a landlord who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized the servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, he, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will provide its fruit. He, he who fails to... He who falls on his stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Thank you very much. The title of my talk today is Making the Most of Your Opportunities. And certainly in, in our lifetimes, we've lived at a time of great opportunity, haven't we? Opportunities for education. Uh, I, I went to university at the age of 18. In, in my school year, there were 240 pupils. Four of us went to university out of our year. Uh, and, of course, that's really increased since then. But great opportunities in employment. Yeah, there's been a few seasons with lots. There's been mass unemployment. But uh, in general, it, there's great opportunities to get find work. Great opportunities for wealth creation. Uh, People are, people's homes are ascending in value all the time. And we've probably got never, we've never had more millionaires in the UK than we've ever had before. And great opportunities in healthcare. Isn't it amazing how within a year of the pandemic striking, we've got all these different vaccines that we can use. But I sometimes wonder if I've made the most of my opportunities in life. For example, I wonder, what would have happened if I'd have put more time into football training when I was a boy? Perhaps I could have made it to the Manchester United team. But then I think, no chance. Well, making the most of every opportunity was Paul's advice to the church at Ephesus. And, and that's really what I want to bring to you from this reading today. It's set in Passover week. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look... Uh, what happened in Passover week because often we, get, we don't get a chance to look at that uh, at Easter because we kind of go from Palm Sunday to Easter day through Monday, Thursday but a lot happened in Passover week where Jesus engaged with question and answer sessions with the Jewish leaders and at the moment he's in the process of telling a number of parables the first was the parable of the two sons and today we're going to look at the parable of the tenants and next week we'll look at the parable of the wedding banquet. And uh, Jesus was telling these parables because he wanted to get under the skin of the Jewish leaders. He, he wanted to expose their hypocrisy. 
And he told a parable and then he asked a question and then he drove, drove home the lesson and he does the same here. But the story is fairly simple, isn't it? It's probably familiar to many of you. A wealthy landowner uh, plants a vineyard and he lets it out to tenant farmers. He rents it out. The idea is they're going to pay rent when the harvest comes in. So harvest time, he sends some servants to collect the rent and they beat them up and kill them. And amazingly, he sends some more, which the same happens. And finally he says, I'm going to send my son. They will respect him. And then the son is killed. And uh, I think all of us would say that is a shocking story. If you read that in the Daily Mail, you know, you'd all be kind of outraged by, by that. And Jesus asked the Jewish leaders a question. Uh, what would the owner of the vineyard do when, if that happened? And they are all of one accord that they would, uh, they would deal very severely with these men, throw them out and then rent out the vineyard to others. And Jesus then draws out the lesson because actually it was a parable about those Jewish leaders. And this is the conclusion in verse 43. I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. So, in judging the tenants in that parable, the Jewish leaders are judging themselves. So let's look at this under two headings. First of all, the tragedy of a wasted opportunity. This parable is about the nation of Israel. The kingdom of God had been given to them and it included two wonderful gifts. First was a land flowing with milk and honey that could produce abundant harvests. And the second gift was the presence of God that was kind of symbolically seen in the temple. And of course Jesus is right now in Jerusalem, in the promised land, in the temple. Uh, symbols of those two great blessings from God. But God gave them a condition. You can have these great blessings, these great opportunities, but you must follow my law, you must follow my instructions. And of course the history of the Old Testament is that they didn't. And God sent prophet after prophet, many that they persecuted and even killed. And the final uh, prophet in that long list was John the Baptist, who not that long before had been beheaded by Herod. And, and of course, here is Jesus, God's son. So it's quite clear, isn't it, as Jesus tells this parable, that Jesus knows who he is, the son of God. He knows what's going to happen to him. He knows he's going to be killed. And, uh, and so God says that he's going to take the kingdom away from these leaders and give them to others. So just think there for a moment. What a tragedy it is that these people miss this amazing opportunity. But what about you and I? What about the opportunities we've had in life, particularly as Christians? Uh, I can look back over my life and see I've had lots of opportunities, lots of blessings. When I became a Christian university, I was part of a group that nurtured me in my faith, that taught me and encouraged me, showed me how to walk with God, to have a ministry with others. And then for several years, I lived with some Christian friends, and we were a great support and encouragement to each other. I've had some great mentors. Uh, one Christian leader and his wife invited me to live with his family to get further training. Uh, I've had two mentors in recent years, both of whom have got great experience and are a real support to me. And I've had great opportunities for study. I, I studied university theology for three years, though I can't really think they'd really helped me that much. But then I went to Spurgeon's College to train as a minister. What a great privilege that was. And over the years I've had opportunities to serve in four churches in Mount Mowbray, in Essex, Leicestershire, and finally here in Bedworth. And I've been to many conferences and I've, I've, I've listened to many great speakers. And I sometimes wonder, have I really made the best of it all? So what about you? Have you made the best of your opportunities? Well, none of us are older. Sorry, none of us are younger than we were. We're all getting older. 
But we, we don't need to despair, because maybe some doors have closed. There's always at least one door that's open. So in your season of life, there is an opportunity if that you will recognise it and seize it. And don't think, oh, it's too late for me. No, it's not. So that brings me to my second heading, the responsibility of a great opportunity. The responsibility of a great opportunity. Jesus said the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you, he was saying to these Jewish leaders, and given to others who will produce its fruit. So who did he have in mind? Well, first of all, he meant ordinary Jews, like the disciples who were excluded. And of course, most of the disciples were actually from Galilee. They were northerners, who the southerners used to look down on. There's a few northerners here in our midst today. Let's have an amen. Um, uh, but of course then the gospel went beyond them to the Gentiles and then of course to the ends of the earth and came down to Bedworth. And we have the privilege of receiving the kingdom of God, of, of knowing the truth, of knowing God. What a great opportunity and yet with it comes responsibility. Has anyone here ever had an allotment? Ever had an allotment? Yeah, some of you, yes. I never have. But I thought it would be interesting to check out what are the responsibilities that come with having an allotment. So I went on a website from the local area and uh, there's a lot of rules. For those of you who have done it will know those rules, but this is one of the key ones. If you're going to have an allotment, you've got to cultivate at least three quarters of your plot. You've got to grow something. In other words, it might be fruit, it might be flowers, it might be vegetables. You've got to grow something and basically... If you don't, they'll take it off you. And in a similar way, when we become Christians, we become believers, God expects us to produce fruit. We can't be content with just believing. But what kind of fruit? Well, as I reflected on that, I kind of wanted to kind of think back through the Gospel of Matthew. Five years ago, we started in chapter 1. We've now made it to chapter 21. We're on our way. What, what have we been learning about fruit? Well, two things. First of all, we, we see that God is looking for the fruit of a changed life. One of the first things Jesus taught the disciples was the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount has, has two aims. The first is this, is to convict us of our sins. So we read the sermon and we say, oh, well, my heart is not pure, or I hate my enemies, or I break my vows, and therefore I need a saviour. So that's one of the purposes of the Sermon on the Mount, to show us our need for Christ. But the second aim of the Sermon on the Mount is once we become a Christian and found the saviour, we should seek to live that out in the power of the Holy Spirit. We won't do it perfectly, but we can still do it significantly. And that's part of our responsibility as a Christian, to live, to produce fruit in how we live. And Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount, as you know, with the wise and foolish builder's parable, and says to them, you must be like the wise man. And that means to hear my words and put them into practice. So Jesus expects us to bear fruit, the fruit of a changed life. The same kind of fruit God's looking for is spiritual descendants. And I take that from Matthew chapter 13, which is a series of parables, including the most famous one, the parable of the sower. See, fruit is not just something we're to eat and enjoy. Fruit is there to produce more fruit trees, more plants, and therefore produce even more fruit. So, God wants us, when we become a Christian, to live a changed life, that's true. But he wants more people to join the church, to join the kingdom, and have their lives changed. In the parable of the sower, you'll remember that Jesus said that the good soul produced lots of fruit, 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. We don't always talk about what that means, but I think one thing it means is God expects the church to multiply. 
First of all, by 30 new Christians, then by 60, and then by 100. And that's what God is looking for. Fruit of spiritual descendants. And that's got to be our aim, isn't it, here at Bedworth Baptist? Not to be content to be together. And it's, isn't it a blessing to do that? It's that we need to see new spiritual descendants. And wouldn't it be great if over the next year our church grew by 30 new disciples? And then the year after, by 60. And the year after that, by 100. According to the power of the sower, that is possible. But how do you produce much fruit? Well, some of you who've got uh, allotments or gardens will be able to tell me, but these are three things that I know. Number one, you need the right soil. Our soil is full of clay. Yours is probably too. And that provides challenges and opportunities. Apparently there's a lot of nutrients in clay that can help certain plants grow. But the trouble is in the winter, it gets waterlogged and that's not good for some plants. And in the summer, it gets very dry. So you've got to keep watering it. And Jesus made the point, of course, if you want to see great fruit with the gospel, you've got to plant your seed in good soil. Uh, and of course, we can't tell from people and the way they look, if they're good soil or not. But it's good to know that people's response isn't dependent on us. It's dependent on them. So the first thing you need is right soil to produce lots of fruit. Same thing you need is to plant lots of seeds. To plant lots of seeds. Because you can't tell if people are interested or not. You've got to spread, sh share spiritual seed with as many people as possible. Jesus and Paul both said the same thing. A man reaps what he sows. And the more you sow, the more you reap. The more plants you put in. Okay, some might die and dry up. or, But at least some will grow. So our responsibility as a church is to share with as many people as possible. And then the third thing you need to be is lots of fruit. Is when the plants spring up, you've got to water them. Yeah, hands up. Who's ever forgotten to water their new plants and found they've shriveled up and died? I know. They need water. And when people express a spiritual interest or make a spiritual response, they need watering. They, they need support, encouragement. That's, that's not the process over. That's just the beginning. Well, this week I planted a pear tree. We've been talking about it for quite a long time. Uh, a couple of years ago I planted a plum tree not had any plums yet but this year there's an abundant blossom so I'm really hopeful this year we're going to get some plums so we wanted another fruit tree and we kind of time had, had gone on and uh, I went on the website a couple of weeks ago of this particular company where we bought the other one from and they said time's almost up you've got to get your tree in now in, you know before the trees are, are, are growing because uh, you've got to plant them when they are they're hibernating and uh, they had a few left so I ordered a pear tree and uh, it came and this week I, I put it in I took a big hole, found lots of clay and then I watched this video that said if you've got clay soil don't mix lots of nutrients with it, you need to kind of put it back in so anyway, so all that clay I dug out, I put it back in and I sprinkled on some, some root grow and some uh, bone meal and things like that and I gave it a good water uh, I saw there was an opportunity a season for planting and I've seized that opportunity and I hope that this will I've got to keep watering apparently through the year uh, but I hope that this will survive this year and then in future years we'll see some fruit well for us as a church lockdown is coming to an end we can see the end in sight don't quite know what's going to happen on June the 21st but it does bring opportunities. Many people have been asking serious spiritual questions. They've been searching the internet. They've been watching our, our, our services on video. They've been reading my blog posts. Uh, and there's an opportunity to invite people along. And it's something that we must seize. You can't go back into your youth again. But you can make the most of today. And we can as a church. 
And wouldn't it be great to see that promise come true for us 30, 60, or 100 times? Let's pray together. First of all, I want to pray for each other. That we would be disciples who produce fruit of a changed life. And it's been a challenging year. But Lord, you brought us to this point. You brought us through. We pray that you would just keep strengthening our faith. And not giving up. And still being concerned for our neighbours. But we also pray, Lord, for the next generations. Pray for particularly our, our children, young people, that they would, through their teaching and nurture here, find Christ and become his disciples. We pray that we'd see more children and more families come into our church. Uh, and we'd see many spiritual seekers find the Saviour. And so we pray, Lord, may us as individuals and as a church, may we produce much fruit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, why don't we stand to say the grace together. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, evermore. Amen. Well, God bless you all. Thank you so much for coming. Can I suggest that those on this half of the church make their way out that way and this side of the church go out that way. And uh, good to see you. I hope to see you next week.